Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Claire Wright. Uh, I am an assistant professor at University of Tennessee in Memphis. I will be uh, lecturing on neovascular glaucoma this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and enable my screen share here. So I have no financial disclosures. Today's lecture objectives, we will discuss or list the most common underlying etiologies for neovascular glaucoma, excuse me. We will detail uh, key clinical features of neovascular glaucoma. We will discuss diagnostic workup of neovascular glaucoma, as well as the medical and surgical management of neovascular glaucoma or NBG. So I have three poll questions that we will review uh, both at the beginning and at the end of the lecture. So our first question, which of the following is not considered a common cause of neovascular glaucoma? Excuse me, let me get this out of the way. Uh, and the options are ocular ischemic syndrome, diabetic retinopathy, central retinal artery occlusion, and central retinal vein occlusion. Okay. So uh, pretty good distribution. So again, we will, we will review these at the end of the lecture. Our second poll question, which of the following is not a clinical sign of neovascular glaucoma? Iris rubiosis, iris atrophy, angle vessels, um, or optic disc cupping? So our third question, which of the following is the optimal surgical intervention for neovascular glaucoma? Cataract surgery with goniotomy, trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, non-valved glaucoma drainage device such as a bare valve, or a valved glaucoma drainage device such as an Ahmed. Okay. All right. Thank you for participating in that. We're going to go ahead and get started here. So Neovascular glaucoma, or NVG, was first described in association with iris rubiosis following a central retinal vein occlusion in a write-up uh, dated back to 1906. Um, neovascular glaucoma is further defined as elevated intraocular pressure in the context of new blood vessel growth and connective tissue growth. That was back in 1963. Um, it goes by other names, or at least historically, um, hemorrhagic glaucoma, congestive glaucoma, thrombotic glaucoma, and rubiotic glaucoma. Um, so what's the pathophysiology of neovascular glaucoma? Well, before we get into the pathophysiology, let's just review the physiology and anatomy of a normal eye. So in the normal healthy eye, there is a balance between pro and anti-angiogenic growth factors with the pro-angiogenic growth factors being um, VEGF and angiopoietin-2, and the anti-angiogenic growth factors being uh, pigment epithelial-derived growth factor, or PDEF. Uh, in a normal, healthy uh, vessel, um, the capillaries are composed uh, or contain non-fenestrated endothelial cells with tight intercellular junctions. And so Picture here, healthy blood vessel, uh, normal amount of oxygenation or normoxia. Now let's contrast this with the pathophysiology of the ischemic eye. And so in the ischemic eye, uh, those pro-angiogenic growth factors uh, tip the balance in their favor. And so what causes this? Fundamentally, there is retina ischemia, which leads to hypoxia, which then triggers a release of VEGF and angiopoietin-2, which then results in activation, proliferation, and migration of endothelial cells. This ultimately leads to angiogenesis with subsequent fibrovascular membrane formation. These neovascular vessels are cruddy. This is what I tell my patients. These new vessels, they're not like your healthy vessels. They're bad. They're kind of shoddily made. There's little or absent muscle layer and little adventitial structures, which means they are prone to leakage and breakage. So again, here's that um, here's the hypoxic um, uh, demonstration on the right of what happens to those capillaries. Um, further kind of flow sheets uh, demonstrating uh, or demonstrating what I've just said. Um, and I, the, the photo on the left is that flow sheet, which demonstrates how hypox hypoxia is the stimulus for uh, VEGF and angiopoietin-2 creation, which then result, uh, results in endothelial proliferation and angiogenesis. 
Um, the photo on the right is, I, I think, an interesting image, um, which is a capillarscopic image of a patient's nail fold, um, which demonstrates uh, what I'm discussing and the results of the, uh, the capillary changes in the um, hypoxic um, uh, hypoxic state. And so on the left of that image, you have what are healthy, normal capillaries. And then as you proceed uh, to the right of that image, you start to get capillary dilatation and creation of new blood vessels or angiogenesis. Um, capillarscopic images of nail folds are used by rheumatologists to monitor uh, numerous um, conditions. I just thought that image was interesting. Now, what are the etiologies of neovascular glaucoma? Most common etiologies are diabetic retinopathy, central retinal vein occlusion, and carotid occlusive disease, or ocular ischemic syndrome. These are the most common. Um, there are other less common ones, including central retinal artery occlusion, um, but these are the three most common. So um, many of us are familiar with what each of these etiologies look like. These are fundus photos of each. Um, we have central retinal vein occlusion or CRVO, that blood and thunder fundus with uh, multiple regions of uh, retinal hemorrhages, vessel tortuosity, sometimes can be associated with optic disc edema. The central image is proliferative diabetic retinopathy characterized by uh, microaneurysms and uh, vessel beating. In this particular case, you have neovascularization of the disc and most, and also probably neovascular uh, NVE or neovascularization elsewhere. The last image on the right, ocular ischemic syndrome uh, characterized by uh, mid-peripheral uh, dot blood hemorrhages uh, representative of uh, retinal um, retinal hypoxia. So these are just a review. We're not going to get into each of these in detail. We're talking about um, how each of these results in neovascular glaucoma. But these are the three primary etiologies, most common etiologies for neovascular glaucoma. So how do these patients present? Well, on slit lamp exam, you uh, these, these patients, uh, this presentation is characterized by neovascularization of the anterior segment. And that can include uh, neovascularization of the iris or iris rubiosis. These new vessels are typically along the pupillary border. I believe that it's because of the thought is that that's where um, the vessel or the, that part of the iris is receiving, uh, is exposed to the most VEGF and pro-angiogenic growth factors because of the flow of aqueous along the pupillary edge. So you get um, earliest signs of neovascularization of the iris along the pupillary border. Um, these are uh, characterized by, uh, or can be contrasted with healthy iris blood vessels because of their pattern. Now these NVI vessels are often irregular in appearance and non-radial in pattern uh, in contrast to normal stromal iris vessels. Um, these vessels can bleed resulting in hyphema. Um, you can also get in patients with NVG, neovascularization of the angle uh, seen on gonioscopy. And the way that I've seen this is there's a reddish diffuse hue to uh, kind of scleral spur or normal kind of otherwise clear structure. So uh, non-pigmented trabecular mesh work kind of, et cetera. Sometimes you can even see the angles branching um, kind of, uh, uh, excuse me, the uh, vessels branching within the angle. But more often than not, the way I see it is a reddish hue to mostly actually non-pigmented uh, trabecular meshwork. Um, and this can result in eventual synechial closure because of uh, vessel leakage and scarring. So uh, images here, neovascularization of the iris along the pupillary border and neovascularization of the angle. Now, these patients can often, but not always, present with elevated intraocular pressure. The reason for that, um, it can either be because of an open angle mechanism or a closed angle mechanism. In the open angle mechanism, this is just probably because of the mechanical blockage of the trabecular meshwork because of those vessels. But you can also get um, congestion from red blood cells if there's um, a hyphema. You can also get um, blockage with uh, hemosiderin-laden macrophages if there's a hyphema. So numerous etiologies uh, for patients with high intraocular pressure in neovascular glaucoma with an open angle. 
Um, many times these patients progress to synechial closure or closed angle, which is another common etiology of uh, ele elevated intraocular pressure in neovascular glaucoma. So these images, open angle with NVA, and then uh, the beginnings of synechial closure in, in, uh, in NVG. So what ought to be your diagnostic workup? Well, the most important thing, well, there's numerous important things here. You have to know why the patient has neovascularization. Do they have a history of diabetes? If yes, how is their blood sugar, blood pressure control? The diabetes control complications trial or DCCT found that standard patients who are not aggressively treated, uh, whose blood sugar was not aggressively treated were at three times the risk of developing neovascularization of the disc over nine years versus the intensively treated group. Now this is NVD as opposed to neovascular glaucoma, but perhaps you could uh, be generous in your extrapolation that then that there may be a parallel with the incidence of uh, neovascular glaucoma development. So high A1C, poorly controlled blood sugar on a daily basis, more likely to result in neovascular glaucoma. However, I've seen patients who have gotten their blood sugar under control have um, with healthy A1Cs who still can develop neovascular glaucoma. So in my observation, there almost gets to be a point where uh, the eye is just going off on its own, uh, even somewhat independently of uh, kind of systemic blood sugar control. So, but usually in those situations, there is a history of poor blood sugar control at some point, which then um, uh, started that angiogenic stimulus. Now, if they don't have diabetes, do they perhaps have a history of a central renal vein occlusion? If so, when was it? When was it diagnosed? When, if it wasn't officially diagnosed, uh, when did the patient experience vision changes? Now this, um, uh, in the context of a central retinal vein occlusion, if they're going to develop nevascular glaucoma, typically it's in the, a 90 day period. So it's called 90 day glaucoma. Uh, it takes about that time frame on average for that angiogenic stimulus to start to take uh, its effect with um, angle changes and elevated pressure. Now, if they don't have a known history of diabetes and that's been ruled out um, with uh, blood sugar checks, A1C checks, and there's no evidence of a central retinal vein occlusion, well, and particularly if it's a unilateral presentation, well, you better rule out ocular ischemia. So you need to obtain a carotid ultrasound to rule out carotid stenosis. Uh, and if that's present, they need to many times get a carotid endarterectomy to improve perfusion to that side. And then you ought to, if you're gonna, if it's not been ruled out already, check the blood glucose A1C and the blood pressure, okay? So um, this is, I really think, uh, you know, equally important is of finding the why of the new vascularization and then also treating, uh, you know, additional diagnosis and testing. So what testing do I uh, obtain for these patients in the office? Well, I'm a glaucoma specialist, so I'm gonna get a visual field, um, uh, some uh, uh, coherence tomography uh, to get to look at that nerve. I'll also uh, look at the macula to rule out any uh, underlying macular edema, which can be associated with diabetic retinopathy or central retinal vein occlusion. I get pachymetry in my um, glaucoma patients. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, whether you're doing this yourself or working with a retina specialist, um, it's, it's prudent to obtain a fluorescein angiography to look for regions, regions of retinal hypoperfusion and or neovascularization, which may be occult, um, which you may not see on your dilated fundus exam, but may be picked up on IVFA. So these are some IVFA images of central retinal vein occlusion, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and ocular ischemic syndrome. So, well, what's our management of neovascular glaucoma? This isn't rocket science. You just need to lower the pressure, and you can do that with medications or surgery. Um, so I'm going to focus on that first bullet point. I'm a glaucoma specialist, but also equally important, well, you need to reduce that hypoxic stimulus or that angiogenic stimulus. And so um, many times that, uh, that consists of panretinal photocoagulation to um, treat that, those regions of hypoperfusion so that, um, that eye doesn't continue to uh, create uh, VEGF. 
Uh, and then if they have macular edema, um, you can treat that with anti-VEGF injections. Um, and so we'll get into the uh, medication and surgical management further in the further slides, but I'll say this, um, in patients with florid iris rubiosis in whom I'm planning on doing an uh, AMA glaucoma valve surgery, I will often um, recommend that they see my uh, retina colleague for an anti-VEGF injection to help regress those vessels prior to my um, doing an AMA glaucoma valve. Uh, that helps minimize the risk of uh, intraocular, uh, intraoperative hemorrhage and can improve um, the overall um, you know, IOP lowering effect from surgery. So we'll talk more about uh, management in the further slides. So let's talk first about medication management. So um, now aqueous suppressants are thought to be more theoretically useful given there's a compromised trabecular mesh work as many of these patients have um, you know new uh, uh, sneakyal angle closure, but really the reality, at least in my practice, is I often am putting these patients on maximum tolerated topicals, regardless of whether or not they're aqueous suppressants, as a temporizing measure before surgery. So many of these patients end up requiring surgery. Now, um, in the interim, some patients require systemic carbonic and hydrase inhibitors for immediate. Uh, IOP lowering and, and typically, so that those medicines are acetazolamide or methazolamide. I am typically uh, relying more on acetazolamide. Of course, you need to make sure they don't have a sulfa allergy or renal dysfunction. Many of my patients here in Memphis um, are very poorly controlled diabetics with uh, like uh, end stage renal disease. And so if that's the case, I can still use a systemic carbonic and hydrazer in a CAI um, diamox essentially, but I'm doing at a lowest tolerable dose, so typically 250 BID, and I'm, I'm counseling them, hey, uh, you know, these are the side effects. You're getting dialyzed, but I'm not going to go too hard on this. Um, uh, other things, other considerations, you know, if you're seeing these patients acutely in the emergency room setting, pressure is very high, you're giving IV diamox and max topicals. Well, if it's safe to, you can do an AC paracentesis to, for immediate pressure lowering, but it's just a little bit, it can be a little bit uh, tenuous in these patients, especially if they have florid uh, rubiosis. You really don't want to accidentally nick one of those blood vessels because then uh, it may be doing more harm than good, but if you can get a safe, uh, safely get a 30 gauge needle into the AC, then for sure you can temporize their uh, acutely elevated pressure with an AC tap. Um, as I've mentioned before, severe cases of neovascular glaucoma are often refractory to medical therapy and require surgery. So we'll talk about surgical management. Um, just across the board, uh, in uh, literature and in my experience and observation, these patients do better with a glaucoma drainage device over trabeculectomy. Uh, that is because of the risk of uh, trabeculectomy flap scarring from neovascular glaucoma, uh, from neovascularization of um, vessels. Um, and also just think about there's that uh, pro-angiogenic stimulus with VEGF, angiopoietin 2 circulating around, going through that flap. So these patients, these, these flaps will just scar really much more easily than non-neovascular glaucoma patients. And so my preferred glaucoma drainage device. Now, if you don't have access to glaucoma implants, well, you're kind of, well, you, you got to do what you got to do. You can do a trabeculectomy, but you really have to watch for scarring. So these patients may require more post-operative needling of the trap flap, um, more uh, use of uh, five fluorouracil injections in the post-operative period to control scarring. Now let's talk more about uh, glaucoma drainage devices. So there are valved and non-valved glaucoma drainage devices, and I apologize if this is very basic for some of you, but um, the, in these patients with new vascular glaucoma, my preference is valved GDDs, such as an Ahmed valve, over a non valve GDD, like a bare valve or an Ahmed clear path, which is a newer one. The reason for that is that you get more immediate IOP lowering. You're not messing around with um, like a, a ligating suture that's going to break down after six weeks. Um, and uh, you, these patients are just have already failed max many times maximum medical therapy. So 
Um, and, and some of these patients aren't good at following up, really. So you don't want to muck around with seeing them on a regular basis, starting medications like one at a time, waiting for that ligating suture to break down in those bare valves. Just put in a valved, um, a valved GDD and you'll get immediate pressure lowering. Uh, and there's less risk of hypotony. Now, um, the challenge with these patients is um, these patients, in my observation, I, I don't have this backed up um, today here with uh, what's in the literature, but these patients like don't do great. You know, um, you put the tube in, you get the pressure down, you start the drops one at a time. My observation is that that hypertensive phase, which many of us see following Ahmed glau uh, uh, glaucoma drainage devices, it tends to be more uh, acute and sooner, at least in my observations. Many times these patients, you put the tube in and they end up on all of the drops afterwards anyways. And so um, it, it's challenging. This is a very challenging form of neovascular glaucoma. Uh, what is really, I emphasize with my patients is, hey, like my job is to get your pressure down so you don't lose more vision, but really it's a co-management uh, tactic that's essential wherein I, as a glaucoma specialist, monitoring the pressure, and then you got to continue to see your retina colleague for serial uh, anti-VEGF if needed, making sure you get the retinal uh, laser, the pan-retinal photocoagulation to decrease that hypoxic stimulus. You got to keep on getting your blood sugar under control. It's, uh, this is, these are just, these patients require uh, a lot more counseling and uh, ophthalmic intervention than um, kind of bread and butter open angle glaucoma because of that hypoxic stimulus and that those pro-angiogenic um, growth factors. The other thing I've observed is that in um, these uh, valved glaucoma drainage devices, so you're getting immediate aqueous exit uh, from the eye around the plate. And what's in that aqueous, but, you know, VEGF and angiopoietin too. And so, um, Many of these patients end up, uh, it was just like that, those pro angiogenic factors outside of, you know, around the plate. And it, it's going to cause, you know, maybe more scarring than um, in a patient without underlying NVG. So that exposure to the um, plate and that kind of capsule uh, to those uh, pro angiogenic growth factors uh, might, you know, just ultimately limit how uh, much of a sustained pressure lowering effect we get. So it's just, it's just very challenging. Um, now you can also do uh, cyclophotocoagulation in refractory cases. Now, in my experience, I typically reserve CPC for patients who are, have already had an almond valve already. Um, or like severe, you could do this in patients who don't want incisional surgery or not stable for incisional surgery for whatever medical reason, you can do a CPC. Micropulse laser um, is also an option um, and it has less chance of hypotony than a cycle, uh, than CPC. So that's also an option as well. But typically I'm reserving lasers for patients who are already status post glaucoma valve. Um, and now I've also read that patients with neovascular glaucoma are at uh, increased risk of hypotony following CPC than not than say patients with POAG. And so that's another consideration to proceed with caution, particularly with CPC in patients with neovascular glaucoma. Um, so that's what I have. I know it's kind of a quick and dirty review, um, but uh, you know, that's uh, uh, neovascular glaucoma is just the most common glaucoma that I'm facing here in Memphis, most likely related to, you know, underlying diabetes, uh, high, high incidence of diabetes in my population here. And so um, I, I think it's been helpful for me to distill the things that I've learned uh, over the last four years of practice into a PowerPoint. So thank you for listening. What we're going to do now is uh, review those questions that I had at the beginning of the lecture. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead uh, and answer these three questions again. So the first question, which of the following is not considered a common cause of neovascular glaucoma? Ocular ischemic syndrome, diabetic retinopathy, central retinal artery occlusion, or central retinal vein occlusion? So which of the uh, following is not considered a common cause? So three of these are the most common causes, one is not. Yes, yeah, central retinal artery occlusion, which most of you got, central retinal artery occlusion is not considered a common cause underlying etiology for neovascular glaucoma. Great. 
So we'll go ahead and answer our next question. Which of the following is not a clinical sign of neovascular glaucoma? Iris rubiosis, iris atrophy, angle vessels, or optic disc cupping? So which of the following is not a clinical sign of neovascular glaucoma? Okay, good. So um, the answer here I was getting at, uh, which of the following is not a clinical sign of neovascular glaucoma is iris atrophy. Um, we've reviewed in this lecture, iris rubiosis, uh, angle vessels or neovascularization um, are very uh, common presenting signs of neovascular glaucoma. And if the patient has glaucoma, most likely they have optic disc cupping. So uh, iris atrophy is the answer I was looking for here. Last question, which of the following is the optimal surgical intervention for neovascular glaucoma? Uh, if you have everything available to you, cataract surgery with goniotomy, trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, non-valved glaucoma drainage device such as a bare valve or valved glaucoma drainage device such as, such as an Ahmed. All right, so the answer I was looking for here, uh, which most of you got, is a valved glaucoma device. Now, of course, if you're in a part of the world that doesn't have access to implants, well, then you, you gotta do what you gotta do. I would go for a trabeculectomy. Um, but just you really have to intensively watch these patients because they're going to be more prone to scarring of that trabeculectomy flap than uh, patients who do not have underlying neovascular glaucoma. So good. Okay, so I'll review quickly the lecture takeaways here. Um, we, in this lecture, we reviewed that the most common etiologies for neovascular glaucoma are diabetic retinopathy, central retinal vein occlusion, and ocular ischemic syndrome. Key clinical features that we discussed in neovascular glaucoma include neovascularization of the iris and angle, elevated intraocular pressure and optic nerve cupping. Uh, management for these patients uh, with neovascular glaucoma uh, includes determining the etiology for neovascular glaucoma and um, uh, control the uh, intraocular pressure with medications, but know that many of these cases are refractory and require surgery, uh, would, and my preference for surgery are valved glaucoma drainage devices or OMEDs. These are my references, uh, just acknowledging our wonderful photographers here at Hamilton Eye Institute. Um, if you all have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me, questions, comments, anything you want to correct about anything I've discussed, um, areas of future discussion or lectures, I'm happy uh, to take comments and feedback. Um, so thank you so much. What we're going to do now is I'm going to um, stop sharing, and then I'm going to review uh, questions that may have come up in the Q&A. Um, so yeah, which of the, uh, I believe this question is asking, uh, what is the preferred anti, uh, uh, anti angiogenic treatment for neovascular glaucoma? Well, that depends. Uh, typically, uh, I'm recommending panretinal photocoagulation to reduce that hypoxic stimulus. Uh, and then anti-VEGF can be indicated as well. We use um, Avastin here um, or Bevacizumab mostly. Let's see. So there's a, a patient question here. Please discuss the following scenario. There's a patient with pseudoexfoliative glaucoma, noncompliance to drops, high pressure, high pressure and presentation, CRVO, uh, massive rubiosis, 360 sneaky closure. They've um, got anti-VEGF started and max topical therapy, vision's reduced, there's cupping, there's still high pressure. Uh, would you proceed with Ahmed valve? Yes. Or diode CPC. Uh, yeah, I would start with Ahmed valve. I really don't do much CPC um, unless they've already had an Ahmed valve placed. So I would do, I would do an Ahmed valve. Um, all right. Is peripheral iridotomy contraindicated in the presence of rubiosis? I would not do a peripheral iridotomy in a uh, rubiotic pupil uh, because of risk of bleeding. And I don't really, yeah. So I, I would, I would, if you need to do if, if a PI to rule out pupillary block or whatever, you know, just get the um, uh, the patient to a retina specialist to regress that NVA, uh, NVI with uh, laser or anti-VEGF. Uh, what do you think is better in terms of uh, neovascular glaucoma management, intracameral anti-VEGF or intravitreal? Uh, well, I um, typically my retina colleagues are doing intravitreal um, anti-VEGF. And so I don't have tons of experience with intracameral, um, but typically we'd get good results with intravitreal. 
Um, is it possible to use pilocarpine every one hour coupled with SLT and lowering IOP in office? Uh, no, I would not recommend laser in these patients, uh, SLT, selective laser trabeculectomy in these patients. Uh, I mean, what's going to happen if you do the laser in the angle when there's new vascularization of the angle could cause bleeding? Uh, these it, SLT is not an indication or uh, new vascular glaucoma is not an indication for SLT. Uh, I'm skipping questions on things not related to uh, new vascular glaucoma. Um, what are the challenges while performing trabeculectomy in new vascular glaucoma? Well, um, think I'm not doing that mostly, but uh, in, in eyes in which I'm doing glaucoma surgery or uh, uh, Ahmed's in with new vascular glaucoma, they just there's just uh, abnormal blood vessels everywhere, uh, including the sclera and episclera, and so. I use select cautery, um, judicious cautery for my tube patients. Um, but you just imagine, wow, if I had to make a trab flap in these patients, gosh, they're going to need a lot of cautery. How much uh, damage are you going to cause with that th uh, thermal burn with cautery that, you know, you're trying to control blood vessels? But, you know, so the challenges are intraoperative bleeding um, and just postoperatively risk of bleeding and scarring. So it's just it's just hard to manage these patients with a trabeculectomy, I think. Um, how does vision affect visual acuity affect the decisions you are making um, now? If they have any vision at all, uh, I'm going to put a tube in their eye. So it doesn't. If they're NLP and it's a blind painful eye, I'm recommending a nucleation with my uh, plastics colleagues. Um, okay. Why not non-valve GDD? Uh, we discussed that uh, risk of hypotony, poor follow-up in my patients. You ultimately get lower pressures with non-valve, but um, you're mucking around with things like a ligating suture and, um, you know, uh, you don't get as immediate lower pressuring, which is ultimately safer for the eye. Um, and there's a higher risk of hypotony in those patients. And so I'm doing a valve glaucoma drainage device, such as an Ahmed for immediate pressure lowering, um, and to not have to worry about them not showing up to manage their, uh, um, inevitably high pressure until that ligating suture breaks down. What is the next step with when PRP does not prevent new vascularization of the angle? Well, um, that's a little bit outside of my purview as I'm a glaucoma specialist and not a retina specialist, but you know, you're doing PRP, you could do PRP fill-in. Uh, I might need to do some anti-VEGF if that PRP uh, initial treatment is not sufficient for new vascularization, uh, ang angle new vascularization uh, regression. What is first, PRP or valve surgery? Uh, now you're going to get a different answer if you're talking to me or my retina colleague, but the pressure is really high. You got to get the pressure down. Uh, so because high pressure, glaucoma, irreversible damage. So my preference is put a tube in the eye, but they might need um, anti-VEGF beforehand to regress any uh, iris rubiosis. Does atropine have a role? No. Um, what would be an ideal treatment to prevent uh, new vascular glaucoma following CRV at its timing. Okay, so that's a great question. So for patients that you're, diagnosis, uh, you're diagnosing a CRVO in, they need to be monitored, uh, I mean, uh, I would say every four to six weeks uh, with serial uh, gonioscopies, eye pressure checks, and uh, dilated fundus exams um, with or without in-office testing, such as OCT macula, to uh, watch for the development of neovascularization of the uh, angle or NVG. So yeah, it's called 90-day glaucoma because you typically get presentation of NVG following uh, CRVOs in around three months. So you really need to watch these patients closely and you need to counsel them while you're watching them closely. You're welcome. <laughs> um, do you keep a patient with NVG with topical steroids and midriatics long-term despite no pain? No, no. Um, I really only use uh, long in patients with the, the role that I, what I use long-term low-dose steroids and midriatics for are patients who are, have a blind painful eye. So we try that first. And then um, if it's still painful, I recommend a nucleation. Um, I've included my email in the PowerPoint. And so um, you're welcome to review that if you'd like to reach out to me. Uh, which anti-VEGF is best for new vascular glaucoma? Whatever you have available. We typically use bevacizumab because it's uh, it's our first kind of line treatment at our institution. It probably the answer to, for that uh, varies probably from institution to institution. Um, okay, does age factor in uh, in terms of which method to use to correct new vascular glaucoma? I don't think so. Uh, I think this applies. You just have to take, you know, kids. Uh, 
management of high pressure in children and uh, depending on the age, like babies, uh, less than less than 12 months or whatever, it's just uh, they require a little bit more uh, closer management postoperatively. Just this is a whole other conversation in terms of surgery and postoperative care and in infants. But I typically uh, recommend, you know, these are recommendations that I think apply to all age groups. Uh, how many doses of anti-VEGF is maximum for neovascular glaucoma? That's a good question for my retina colleagues. I'm not sure. I think at least in this country, we really can't do more than one injection. I think that's 1.25, whatever the standard dose is, uh, more often than every four weeks. Um, is there any, let's see, is there any special situation of NVA which contradicts the use of anti-VEGF? Not sure what that means, but I don't, I can't think of any. Um, how many times can valve surgeries be repeated in neovascular cases? Well, I've seen patients who've had three tubes in their eye. Um, so as, if you've got room for it, you can put it in, but you only have four quadrants to work with. So I guess four times. Um, Will emergency AMID valve uh, control IOP without adequate PRP or anti-VEGF treatment? Yeah, I think it, it can temporize the pressure, but you ultimately need to um, reduce that hypoxic stimulus with PRP and uh, anti-VEGF treatments. Um, how many times is it possible to do cryotherapy before taking the decision for evisceration? So, okay, um, let me... Uh, how many times is it possible to do so like cyclophotocoagulation or cryotherapy? Now, um, if you don't have an AMED valve available or if it's very expensive, if you're looking for IOP control, I would start with trabeculectomy. Um, if the vision is very low, uh, you can do cryotherapy or well, cyclophotocoagulation would be preferred over cryo. Um, if it's just refractory to treatment, patient, um, I, I, I wouldn't recommend evisceration or enucleation in, until the patient doesn't see. So uh, NLPIs, is, those are the patients that I'm referring for uh, evisceration or nucleation, patients with blind, painful eyes. Um, I personally do not perform cyclophotocoagulation or micropulse laser in blind, painful eyes. Um, I, I think it's just, for me, I, I'm a little bit nervous about uh, theoretical risk of sympathetic ophthalmia, especially if they've got a good seeing eye. So I just refer these patients uh, for oculoplastics management. Um, do I need to combine both valve GDD and anti-glaucoma drug? I mean, typically I'm putting these patients on drops uh, to temporize them for surgery. And many times these patients need to be put on, back on drops after surgery. So yeah, if they, I'm signing them up for surgery, I'm put, starting them on drops to get that pressure down because uh, I want to make sure they can tolerate the drops and not aren't allergic to them because they'll need them long term. Uh, I don't have experience in using Paul's valve. I've heard good things. Uh, we've got our uh, FDA uh, likes to you know limit things here when they're doing their job. But you know I, I've heard about Paul's valve instead of Ahmed valve, but I don't have experience with it. Um, any role for cyclodiode and IOP management? Yes, we discussed that. Um, so NLPI, as I mentioned, uh, if I don't personally do laser, I know of people who do. I think that's um, kind of individual decision. Um, but uh, certainly if the patient really felt strongly about not having a nucleation and wanted a laser, then I would um, consider a laser. But typically blind, painful eyes that are painful despite maximum tolerated drops, I refer to plastics. Um, if an omnivalve valve surgery fails, what is the next in NVG management? Well, uh, if by fails, yeah, so so make sure they're um, doing their drops, put them on back on max topicals. If the surgery fails, typically, and if they only have one tube in their eye, you can consider, I would do, it just depends on the situation, but I would do laser, micropulse laser, um, and because that can um, get the pressure down, especially in the presence of a tube. My observation is that uh, I don't I don't have data to back this up, but my observation at this institute is that patients who are status post almond valve have pretty good pressure lowering effect after micropulse. Um, I think it's, it's almost like it kind of in, improves fluid, uh, you know, uh, aqueous egress. I'm not sure. Again, I need to look at the data there, but uh, patients who are status post almond valve who uh, and whose pressures are uptrending, I'm recommending micropulse. Uh, let's see here. Let me try to find where I'm at with questions. Um, 
yeah, what is the role of anti-VEGF agents? We've discussed that. How much time should we wait to do glaucoma drainage device after intravitreal anti-VEGF? That's a great question. I was just reading that um, you kind of get this like window, uh, uh, kind of golden window of a couple weeks, like one to three to four, um, wherein that anti-VEGF is kind of kicking itself into gear, helping regress those vessels. And so I would uh, typically at my institute with uh, my patients here I like to do an Ahmed valve within like one to two weeks of anti-VEGF injection to try to get in uh, that tube in the eye while the uh, vessels are regressed. Um, let's see here. We talked about how um, vision affects my decision making, you know, any vision at all, I'm going to put a tube in the eye. Uh, what is first PRP or valve surgery? We talked about, you know, that just depends on who you're talking to, but really get that pressure down lower uh, because you can get, um, you know, glaucoma, any vision loss in glaucoma is irreversible. You know, so, um, yeah, so we want to get that pressure down lower. That's a priority. Um, is it okay to do int in intravitreal anti-VEGF in high pressure? Yes. Uh, if the pressure is high and they need anti-VEGF, you can do a tap, AC tap, anti-VEGF injection, repeat tap. Uh, that's what we do at our institute here. In vascular glaucoma, it is so difficult to get the pressure down. It is. I hate NVG. Is cyclodestruction with cryo effective? Uh, yes, we don't do that here in this, uh, at least at our institute, but certainly if you only have access to a cryo laser, yes, but you just have to be careful because uh, I believe that the risk of hypotony is higher in these patients with NVG as opposed to patients with uh, other kinds of glaucoma. Uh, I'm not going to discuss antibiotic resistance. Um, uh, can anti-VEGF induce closure of the angle with NVA due to fibrous tissue? Yeah, I think so. It could, but um, you kind of have to take that as taking the good with the bad. Uh, you need to reduce that hypoxic stimulus, regress those vessels. It may kind of zip the angle closed, but it's just, I mean, you got to get the, reduce that stimulus and you're most likely going to put a tube in the eye anyways. Um, um, let's see. What are the symptoms actually? Good question. So uh, in patients with um, who are have acute NVG, it's, they're going to present with oftentimes, well, many times they have decreased vision regardless if there's an underlying, uh, you know, like thing like diabetic retinopathy, central retinal vein occlusion, ocular ischemic syndrome. A lot of times they've had blurry vision already but it can get blurrier or decreased vision because of high pressure. So decreased vision, high pressure causing pain, red eye, um, headache, things like that. Symptoms basically from high pressure. And so that would be the, the symptoms that I would expect with patients. Um, if trabeculectomy fails, what's next if GDD not available? Well, you can do a blood revision. Just uh, lift up that flap, try it again, uh, or do a laser CPC or cryo. What is the management for high pressure? We discussed that drop surgery. Um, what is the mechanism of diabetic retinopathy leading to blindness? We did not really get into diabetic retinopathy today. What steroids you put NVG patients on? I do prednisolone for all my patients after surgery. Now, if there's a known history of uh, um, steroid response, I just watch for that. And um, usually I have my patients after uh, glaucoma surgery, um, excuse me, the Ahmed valves beyond uh, steroids for about six weeks. If they're having a steroid response, I kind of try to taper that or switch to a lower potency steroid like loprednol. Um, will the symptoms be a mix of all the risk factors? Not sure what that means, but yes, yeah, symptoms are basically decreased vision, eye pain from high pressure. Um, what is the management of MVG without visualization of the fundus? We see that a lot if they've got uh, vitreous hemorrhage or dense cataract. And so, well, got to get the pressure down, drop surgery. And so, and then once you temporize that pressure, then why is the vision blurry? Is it vitreous hemorrhage? Treat that with anti-VEGF or surgery. Is it a cataract? Do the cataract surgery? And so, but really uh, priority is getting the pressure down. Um, why not val non-valve GDD as effective as valve GDD? We kind of, uh, kind of explain this. Now, it's not as a matter of effective. It's just that you need to get immediate pressure lowering response. And so you get that with valve GDDs because you're getting immediate egress of aqueous through that valve as opposed to a non-valved. The reason why the non-valves you're not getting uh, egress of aqueous, and I apologize if this is basic, is that you can't have immediate, you, you need to do a ligating suture to basically you need time 
for that um, plate to develop a capsule around it, okay? Because if you have immediate outflow uh, through the non-valve tubes, you're gonna get hypotony. So in valve or non-valve, like a bare valve, you need to have a ligating stitch uh, to allow about six weeks for that capsule to form around the plate. And so during that time, think about it. Oh, uh, and then you could do like fenestrations of the tube to allow some egressive fluid, but these patients, the post-operative care is much more nuanced than a valve tube or a, a valved tube, like a glaucoma, um, omeglaucoma valve. So um, these patients really need a uh, regular follow-up. They need to typically be put on max drops afterwards. Um, may need to like, like ligate, uh, excuse me, the, yeah, um, basically laser that um, ligating suture early, but like, Really, the reality is, at least in my patients with new vascular glaucoma, like you need pr immediate pressure lowering now. You can't muck around with making sure they're reliable, relying on transportation, getting to see you. You just need to put a tube in the eye and get that pressure lower. And so it's not that the non valves aren't effective, they're great. You get lower pressures with them. You know, in many studies, it's shown that you get lower pressures with bare valves versus Ahmed's, but you need immediate pressure lowering in these patients. And so you're just not messing around with that. Put an Ahmed in these patients. So uh, can NVG happen with diabetic retinopathy, CRVO, or OIS? Uh, without, yeah, yeah, those are the most common. So yeah, you can get them in, you can get in another etiologies, which I just didn't uh, cover here. And so um, the answer is yes. Um, what is your opinion doing needle, needling a drainage implant to lower pressure? I haven't done that. Um, I don't really know if there's a role for that here. Uh, and so, but I know of people who've done that, but typically that's for, for other reasons, not related to NVG. How to prevent NVG? Great question. Uh, yeah. And this goes back to counseling the patient, um, control the blood sugar, blood pressure, making sure their underlying, you know, vasculopathic risk factors are being addressed um, in those ways. Um, and then basically serial and regular uh, eye exams uh, for vision, pressure checks, gonioscopies, and dilated fundus exams. And so uh, that would be it. Um, so I think I'm going to, I'm going to call it there. Thank you so much for participating. I hope you got a lot out of this and uh, feel free to reach out to me with questions. Um, and uh, have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are.